Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the By Word Show. So glad you're here. You guys, I'm honestly so pumped for this episode because this is a topic that I love and I'm passionate about, but we've never actually done a dedicated episode on the show. So number one, I'm super psyched to introduce you to Grace Griffith. And secondly, we're going to be talking about branding and messaging, building your business, like all of those things. She's the guru. So Go ahead, Grace. Would you just introduce yourself for those who don't know you yet? Yeah. Well, my name is Grace Griffith. I am a copywriter and a messaging strategist. And my heart and mission is to help business owners really package their the heart and soul of their business into words that sell and bring in the revenue, which is nice when you can do both because yes. I, I work with a lot of business owners who really want to help people. And when you can do both, help people and make money at the same time and really feel like you are serving people in the way you feel like you're called to do and still be fulfilled financially, emotionally, spiritually, all those things at the same time. um, That really, that's, that's just such a great place to be in. And so when you have your words communicate who you are and what you do and how you do it in a very specific way so that your audience can understand and get to know you on that really personal level, which is not something that's super common on in the digital landscape. Right. Um, But there's a specific way to do it so that you are really building that trust without even having those personal conversations right away. And so that's really what I love to do for business owners. And that usually looks like writing copy for websites or email copy. I do social media content too. So it really just depends on what you need for your business. But um, yeah, so I work with a lot of creatives, creative entrepreneurs, service providers, educators. Um, So yeah, that's a little bit of what I do in a nutshell. That is so cool. I think that's so fun. And what I love about it is kind of what you said, just getting that trust factor, like the personal side of the branding conversation. Cause I feel like in recent years, people are just tired of being sold to like, they can tell if it's an ad, they can tell if it's sponsored content, you know, and it's just, it's so, it gives people the ick, you know, for lack of better terms, like that's what's going on right now. And so what I think is really unique about what you do and what you teach is really aligning, like actually who you are and then what you can provide to serve your audience. So I, I'm really, I'm really excited personally to unpack this and just sit here and soak up all of your wisdom. Um, but it's, it really is so inspiring to see your approach. That's all about, and you use this language, empathy driven marketing and business. So could you explain to us kind of what that looks like and how that approach came about? Like, did you always run your business this way? Sure. So empathy is kind of a fluffy word and it can mean a lot of different things. And so when I think I, I used to be a teacher, like I used to teach second and kindergarten. We talk about empathy all the time as an approach to teaching because you want to know, you you have to understand the background of where your students are coming from. And it also applies to business. You have to understand the stories that your audience is carrying before they interact with you. So it's it's really about relationships and thinking mm. about like what you're bringing to the table and what they're bringing to the table as well before you try to even serve them and real before you even know if you're a good fit for them. Mm. And I think too, like you said, we feel that ick when we are being sold to. And a lot of the the people I work with, they feel that ick when they're selling. And mm. it just does it doesn't feel good because we know what it feels like to be sold to. We don't want to be contributors to that feeling when we have an empathetic approach to our marketing. It takes that ick away because we're focusing on what really matters to begin with, which is relationships. And that's really humanizing your audience and realizing there's a lot that I need to unpack and really understand before I can serve them, before I can really contribute to what they they need. And um, I think it's also just a level of humility, too, Mm. before... But before you just assume I have what you need or you need my product or you need my service or whatever, 
um, you're really getting to know them in a deep and intimate way. And there's certain ways to do that. And we can talk about that more if you want to. Um, but re really, at the end of the day, it all comes down to relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to unpack that because you're so right. Like people, people can tell when it's insincere and when you're just trying to sell and also being on the side of having something to sell or offer. It's like, I don't know. I almost feel like I, I, I've been there and I've talked to so many other women who are like, I don't know how to present myself. Like, I don't want to be weird about it. I don't want to sound like I'm pressuring, but also like we have to be confident in our offer and all those things. So it's like, where do we find the sweet middle ground there and start that process of making it really about relationship? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because finding that confidence too, there's there's like that fine balance. Right. First, it, it really starts with listening, like getting to know your audience and having those conversations before you just assume you're serving the right market even. Like when I yeah. started my business, I wasn't a copywriter. I was serving a specific group. I was actually serving other teachers. And then mm -hmm. I realized the more I started listening to what the people that I that were in my community, what they needed, I started pivoting little by little, little by little, little by little, and then really tried to match my offer with what with the people that I wanted to serve and then what they actually needed. So it's all about listening and then making sure you're listening to the right people too. Because you might have it on your heart to serve a certain group of people, but there's another group of people that just seems to be a little bit louder. And that can be on Instagram. It could be your competitors, which is so important to know what your competitors are doing and just to be aware, but also know who it is you're supposed to be serving and know what language they're using to talk about their pain points. Like, um, speaking of pain points, I had a client recently who, she's a fitness coach, and she really wanted to, to phrase and use language that was both motivational, but also compassionate. The fitness industry is, it can be very interesting. There can be, people come in with different expectations. And one of them is, I really need motivation. Like I really need someone, I need the accountability. But there's also so much baggage that people bring to that place. There's so much that has contributed to their understanding of what fitness is. And so they have to do the mindset work before they really understand what is exact, it is exactly that they need. Mm. And sometimes they don't even know. And the coach as the guide has to kind of prep them and build that that mindset and and reframe some of the language they've been using to talk to themselves before they're really able to start making taking action and learning to make that improvement and be successful so using certain language and understanding what words your audience is using to talk about those pain points and, and even like what they're looking for, that can be really key to making your audience feel seen and mm. understand, okay, I know I need this, but this person is talking about in a little bit of a different way I haven't heard before. And I feel safe with this person. Mm. And so there's just, there's so many ways to show that you're listening to because you have to listen first, but then showing that you've done the work to listen by using your audience's words and using the phrasing to, to really show I'm, I'm with you and I've, I understand your experience. Got to wow. build that trust. You've got to build that safety. I love that word safety. It makes people feel safe. It makes people feel comfortable. It doesn't feel so much like so snaky. Like they're just trying to convince you, oh, you need this and I've got what you need. It's more like, hey, I really hear you, which to me as somebody who's looking for a product or a service, like that's that's what I would probably respond the most to. And so I, I just think that's a really cool approach. And obviously that does take T take some work on the front end to do that listening piece, like you said. So talk to us about what that process would look like. Maybe if you were sitting with a woman or a client who was at the beginning of this journey to really clarify her branding, her messaging, her voice, what would you say are some key things when it comes to starting that process of 
listening and then figuring out how you're going to present yourself and what you have to offer and all of those things. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I realized I didn't answer your question about, or I didn't really speak to building that confidence, but I think that, cause you need to, especially when you're starting out for the first time. Um, so to really get started with listening, be in, be in the spaces, be in the spaces where your, your audience is. So if you're, you have an online business, get in those Facebook groups, get in those conversations, but start having those one-on-one conversations with people and put yourself out there. Like put yourself out there as a thought leader to Mm. give your perspective, share your story, be vulnerable, but in a way that centers the person that you're serving. Because there's a fine line between telling your story just to tell your story, but telling your story that really positions the person who's listening to you, that's a, that's a skill that really helps make people feel seen too. Put yourself out there and do it often. Like you have to put yourself out there and you have to start using your voice to be able to find it. And you have to do mm. it consistently too because that's, that's how you're going to build that confidence. You're not going to just automatically – I think so many times we just expect, I mean, I, I've been, I've been guilty of those too, but like, we just expect our voice to just fall into place. Like, right. Like Ariel gets her voice back (laughs) and it's just going to be automatic. And that's not how it works. You have to start cultivating your thoughts and your Mm. opinions and um, you have to listen to other leaders in the industry too, to understand what you agree with, what you disagree with, what maybe use a combination of different ideas to form your own. Um, Mm. Another thing to remember is, you know, we can't wait. You can't wait too long to make yourself sound unique because we're also a combination of all the, of all the people who have poured into us and all of them listen to, but you have to start using your voice to find it. Um, Another thing is you have to be careful. I think I mentioned this in terms of your audience, but you have to be careful about the voices you allow yourself to listen to, to inform your voice. Because so many times, and it doesn't matter how long you've run your business, we get stuck comparing ourselves to other people, but it's masked in using or finding inspiration. Mm. And... That's so tricky because we need inspiration to stay motivated and to build confidence. But at the same time, if you continue to just focus on finding inspiration, you never learn how to use yourself as inspiration. One of the ways that I tell the business owners I work with to, to, to help them find their voice and to find like little nuggets of their thought leadership is to record themselves having a conversation with a client. Or having a pod, like listen to a podcast interview they've done, or um, even just like record themselves, record yourself talking and just ad libbing on a certain topic or something you're passionate about. And then go through and find different points that really speak to your audience that you can use to repurpose later and, Hmm. and test it and see how people respond because that's how you find your unique voice by identifying what those things are, what those, what your stance is on those things, and then put them out there and put them out there consistently and see, see what happens, see how people respond. Um, But yeah, you've got to be consistent. You've got to avoid comparison and you've got to use your voice to find it. That is all so good. And just sitting here shaking my head because I, I just know, like I have, I've done all those things. I've, tried all the wrong ways, basically. (laughs) And I feel like that's part of the process. But you had such a good point about comparison disguised as, oh, I'm looking for inspiration or I'm learning. Like, I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember when I was first diving into this internet world of, you know, business and being strategic with my social media content. I looked at people like Marie Forleo, Jenna Kutcher, you know, like these big names in social media. And I would do every course, every guide, every resource they had available. And I would just 
repeat what they were saying basically. And I would basically clone what they were doing and feel like, okay, if this is what they did to be successful, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. And it took me so long to find my own voice because I was just copying what I saw other people doing. And I just, uh, that, that just really took a long time for me to overcome because I would get in the cycle of feeling so frustrated and it would cause me not to want to show up anymore. Like I wasn't being consistent. And so it was this perfect storm of things that I was like, okay, I'm doing what they're saying to do, but I'm not seeing the results. So I'm frustrated. So why am I doing this anyway? I give up. I just want to quit. It's not even worth my time and energy anymore. And then I would be like, okay, well, nothing's changing. I need to go back to what they're saying. I need to do this, this, and this, and I need to post every day. And I need to build my email list and I need to do this, this, and this. And if I ever want to be successful, and it was just so frustrating, it led to burnout. And I, number one, didn't know who I was and what my actual voice was, didn't have that piece of clarity. And I was so discouraged and frustrated all the time that I, when I showed up, it was so it just wasn't authentic because I just felt pressured to make the sale or pressured to grow my audience. It wasn't like me doing the relationship piece of listening to my audience, figuring out their need, and then sharing my own story, my own, you know, personal pieces of me that meet their need and connect their need to what I had to offer. And I just, it tripped me up for so long. So I'm curious have you seen other things like that with women or maybe people you work with? Like what, what things do you recommend avoiding or what are some mistakes you see people making in this marketing branding world? Well, I think I I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that lack of consistency, I feel like that is one, if you're consistent, that is one of the tricks to kind of help you work out some of those voices that you feel like you're repeating a lot. You know, like you said, like even though you were trying, you were copying some of the same things that these other leaders were saying, you knew that it didn't feel like you. You had this, um, you were having these self-conversations with yourself about what felt right and what did it. That's really productive. Like mm. it's, you might even feel like that's not, it's, sometimes it feels like failure because the way you phrased that was a little bit, it sounded like I couldn't, I just didn't find my voice. But it was actually really productive because you were able to figure out, I don't want to sound like that. I tried it, didn't work. And that's what consistency does for you is even if you don't get it right, you know probably why, or at least that's not what I want to sound like. So consistency does a lot for you, even if you don't have the other factors yet. That's for you. And that builds confidence <laughs> and there's does a lot of things, but for your audience, it builds so much trust. I work with, I work with a lot of business owners who want launch copy and want to launch their, uh, you know, sales emails for their next course. And those are all so important. But what we typically leave out is all of the pre-work that goes before that to build those relationships, which is built on the back of consistency, consistent weekly emails or showing up on Instagram day after day after day, even when you don't feel like it, but just knowing that this is relational equity that I'm putting in the Mm. work for that's going to pay back later. And you'd be surprised how much that improves your launch numbers when you have the data and the commitment that goes into a launch three months before you even start promoting those products. So that's something that I think gets overlooked quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Totally. That absolutely makes sense. And I feel like it all kind of connects because as you were talking about that, I was like, this makes sense because how many people don't show up consistently because they lack the confidence. And then when we lack the confidence, it's just this, this back and forth mess. And so I'm like, man, I love what you said about how the consistency is just as important for us. The person who is selling, giving the offers, you know, like speaking the voice of the messaging that's so huge. And I feel like, I don't know if it's just because of the 
the world we're in now with the social media, online businesses and all of that, that we just feel pressured to sell and pressured to like make it all about the data, make it all about the outcomes, the, you know, the, the stats, the sales, whatever. But it's just, it's, it's crazy to me how, when you disconnect the relationship from the outcome, it makes such a huge difference. If that makes sense. Cause I feel like for me, the times that I felt so frustrated and burnout in my own business is when I feel the stress of, Oh, I have to make money. I have to make these sales. I have to hit this goal. And it totally takes away the focus of I'm here to serve. I really want to help people mm-hmm. listening to what they're saying. And then you know, responding to that need in my messaging. And so I guess, could you speak to that? Cause I, I love again, what you said in the beginning about how, you know, we, we want to also make money. (laughs) And so there's a way to do that balancing the need of like making it about other people serving, listening, but also like this is a business. So how do you balance the business side versus the relational side? Absolutely. I did not make this phrase up and you've probably heard it before, but it's this reframe that we have to do in our minds that serving, that selling is serving. Mm. Because when you have put in the work to make your product the best it can be or your service the best it can be, and you totally 100% believe that at the end of the day, you are making a difference for your audience and for your clients and your customers, then you are helping them. Like you're serving Mm making money is an act of service for your audience. They're willing to pay you to get the time with you, to get that investment with you. And so when you remind yourself constantly that I have got, I have helped these people achieve these results, then it gives you that fuel, that confidence to pitch yourself, to put yourself out there. But you need to be doing that. And that's something mm. you need to be doing consistently too to build your confidence. I I always say, and I I tell this to myself too because I I need to be doing this more personally and it, just in my business. But like, you need to be pitching or selling at least once a week in in different kinds of ways because there's ways to sell that aren't slimy that aren't picky. Sharing a testimonial or talking about someone's experience they had working with you or a conversation you had with a client. You're positioning yourself as their guide or as that that person that can help them, that investment they can receive every time you just share a glimpse of that experience. Mm. And so when you do that consistently, it not only consistently positions you as that helper for your client, but it also reminds you every single time. It's kind of like I'm really into buyer psychology and um and just psychology in general but i think about neuroplasticity when yes. you sell or even just use your messaging in any way in general but when you sell you're building those neuron those neural pathways in your brain mm. and make it easier and easier and easier for you to do it every single time and it feels more natural and it becomes easier to do and then you 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 know, the more you do it, you find your voice, you find your unique selling proposition, you find, you start connecting more, but you're connecting more with yourself every single time too. And so it's really, really powerful. And so I think just using that reframe that I am helping every single time I pitch myself, just knowing that you have something unique to contribute to the world that people are missing out on if you hold back, if you let your fear hold you back remembering that is so powerful and can have big financial results for you. Seriously. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. I think you're so right. And it's just, it's amazing just listening to you explain it that way, how much it does for us as the person offering. It's like, it does as much good for us to offer what we have to offer as it does for the people who are receiving it. Like, like you said, I I love that you said the world would miss out if we weren't showing up and offering it. And so I feel like right there is the anecdote for all the um, imposter syndrome and lack of confidence, like showing up again and again, teaching yourself, okay, what I have to offer is valuable. It matters. It's making a difference. Serving, selling is an act of service. Like, just a simple reframe like that perspective shift 
can make such a huge difference. I really, really love that. And so I'm curious on the practical side of things then, are there things that we can do to make interactions with our audience or with clients to make it a really good experience, whether it's starting that initial relationship connection or when you're actually working with a client? Absolutely. So this one feels kind of broad, but there's there's specific ways to use it. Asking really good questions in a practical sense. Like when you're working with a client, um, and this really depends on your industry. So let's talk about like asking a question to get a testimonial. If you are asking a good question in a certain way, like rather than asking a question like, um, how would you describe your experience working with me? Or something like that. Something super broad that's super open-ended, which you do want open, open-ended questions, but there's nuance there. You, you really can't control what results you're going to get with that kind of, you could get one word. You could get one mm. word, and that's not super. <laughs> Instead of phrasing it like that, you could say something like, what was your experience with like using the fitness example? What was what was your routine with fitness before we started working together? Or what mm. would you use to describe the way you thought about fitness before we started working together? You're going to get so many more words that your prospects would be able to identify with with just that question. Follow up question, how would you describe it now? And you are basically giving them the opportunity to describe the difference in the transformation without even specifically saying, what's the transformation you experienced? You're positioning their response or you're positioning the question to trigger a response that really illustrates the experience Mm -hmm. and the transformation so much better than just making it a simple question. So that's one way to do it. Um, but asking good questions too, so that's that's kind of how you what you get out of a good question. When you ask a good question to a prospect or to your audience, and it's very specific, like let me think of a different industry. Let's say you are a mindset coach, and um, or let's let's do it a different way, a money coach. And you are finance coach, and you are trying to get into the thinking that that's kind of led to the decisions that your clients have have made this far. So you're asking, you're trying to get behind the get behind the thing behind the thing, and asking a question like, "What what was an experience you had where you made a decision like that before?" or you mentioned that you felt scared when you made this decision. What made you feel scared? That question in itself kind of kind of feel like a therapist in that moment. But like <laughs> it shows that you're listening because you're using the words that they used to frame that question. And that makes people feel seen. It makes them feel like they can open up more and they can trust you. So you're building relational equity when you're asking those questions and building that trust. And that improves the experience by far every single time. That's in your conversation. When you are building your experiences, like a course or your launch campaigns, or even like your social media content, just with specific formatting things, because there's lots of things to do with words. But this is where design actually comes in and user user design comes in really nicely because when you're thinking about the time that your audience is using to consume what you have to say, it causes you to make different decisions about how you format things, the number of words that you use to say something. Um, But conciseness is just such a gift (laughs) these days. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> we don't have time to read blog posts after blog post after blog. I mean, I don't. I would love to. But I don't. <laughs> right? I don't consume content the way I would love to. I like we studies show that we are we just have shorter attention spans. And that's just something that culture and society has done to us and this is probably going to be something that continues gener- generation after generation. But knowing that is the that is the context 
that our audience is consuming what we have to say. So we need to structure what we have to say within that short attention span. And so if you can't really get it in that concise format, does it need to be said? Mm. Asking those questions to really respect the way that your audience is going to consume and the time it's going to take to to consume your course or build that trust with you, that that's a build, big trust builder too. So those are just a few practical ways to really start building that experience in an empathetic way. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's super helpful. I really love that. Um, I'm a super mindset nerd too. And yeah. NLP, are you, I'm sure you're familiar with neuro-linguistics programming, all the things. That's pretty much exactly what you were explaining. Just how can we ask better questions? How can we better position ourselves? How can we better? And I just love how it really does make such a huge difference. Just a small shift to show that you're listening and then making the person that you're interacting with feel so understood and safe and seen. Um, it, it just makes it such a better experience all around. So I, I love that so, so much. I would love to know, what do you think are like the key things that you would say, okay, if you want to build an empathy driven brand that really meets people's needs, that is successful financially, you know, that just ticks all the boxes. What would you say are the key things that are a must do in order to build a brand like this? I just feel like listening in different ways is so important. And the ways that you do that, the ways that you find those opportunities, sometimes it's really hard to find the right conversations. Mm. It's hard to find the relationships that are going to give you the information that you need. That sounds kind of manipulative, actually. No, but for real, like when you think about, like I need to put myself in a situation or find a place where I can find my, my ideal audience so I can listen to them. But at the same time, knowing that if I have this conversation, I might be able to help. Mm. And I struggle with that a lot because <laughs> marketing feels manipulative depending on how you do it. And that's really the whole point of having an empathetic and a relational approach. Mm. But knowing that, you know, at the end of the day, I want to help and really trusting your instinct on that. So finding those conversations and just doing it often, getting mm. in the room with the people you can help and then being consistent with it, putting yourself out there, really shaping your voice and not being afraid to speak up, even when you feel like you don't have a lot to say. Because I think that's really intimidating when you're brand new and you don't feel like you have a, that much to contribute, then you're, you're, you're tempted to back off and you're tempted right. to just not speak up. But realizing that no, I have all of these experiences besides just the topic that I'm speaking of that contribute to what I bring to the table mm. that will help me shape my voice. Like I mentioned that I used to be a teacher. Like that is totally a contributor to what I do now. Knowing that this is something that I have done that has shaped me, like shaped who I am, shaped what I do. It shapes every single interaction I have with my audience that is valuable. And so yes. realizing that that work that I've done, I mean, it could be the work that you've done with your relationships with friends or with your family members, therapy, like all of that shapes the person that you are today and has made you such a valuable contributor to the industry that you're in. And so knowing that and remembering that because the mindset is so huge. So you have to position yourself in a way that sets you up for success first and foremost and then allows you to serve and then i think the other thing would just be learn by taking action like you mentioned and i i do this too like uh, buying courses um learning from business coaches i before i purchase any kind of education which i'm a huge like i i think that education is so valuable and cannot be understated it's so so important but whenever you are in, in an opportunity to learn from someone else, ask yourself first, is this, 
is this an experience or skill set that I will learn more by doing something and by taking action to put myself out there or, you know, with speaking, for example, if I feel like I need to just get on more stages or get in front of more audiences, is it really a mindset thing? Do I need to be taking action? Is that what's holding me back? Mm. Or is it that I really need the education? It could be both. But you might need to do both in order to get some traction in that area. And so learn by taking action every single time. That's so good. That's huge. I think that right there is an, a major key because especially when you're in the beginning stages of your business or even like you mentioned, pivoting from one field to another and starting a brand, it can be so intimidating to feel like, where do I even begin? How do I start to show up? How do I position myself as the leader in this industry? And so I love that, just being able to ask yourself, okay, is this something that I just need to learn more about or do I need to take action? Because I do feel like so much of the time we get the clarity that we're looking for when we just take one step and learn when we fail or, or you know, try something that doesn't work. Like you said earlier, whenever, because this is a struggle that I deal with all the time, is reframing failure to just learning. I, it's productive. I love how you said that because nothing really in this process is a failure. It's just learning what works, learning more about yourself, learning more about your audience, improving the way you present your offer and what you have to offer and all of those things. So I think that's absolutely so huge. So when it comes to somebody who may be in that beginning stage of like, I think I need to take a step. I think like, I don't know, I'm scared to put myself out there. Like, where would you tell that woman to begin? So it depends on your industry. It depends on your business model. Um, and the, you know, that makes me think too, like so many times when we're just starting out, we're not super clear even on mm. our business model. So you still need to take action to get that clarity. So my suggestion would be start start making stuff like start start writing start start creating opportunities for people to connect with you and that's so scary but there's so many opportunities like the way the, the way the internet is set up now it's just there's so many opportunities and it's so easy to create communities online to uh, start building an audience that might look like posting on Instagram a few times a week that may look like doing an Instagram live and just talking and seeing who engages it might look like starting your email list and sending emails every single week I definitely recommend doing that before even launching any kind of product mm. because you've created these mediums to have those conversations before you start serving by selling. And so that's a way to build your confidence as a salesperson, but also building that trust. So you mm. know you have that equity before you even start selling. Building those pathways for those conversations. And like I kept kept saying, like show up for the conversations, but sometimes you need to create the conversations and create the, mm. the platforms for the conversations to happen. Start dabbling, start start playing, but do it consistently. Like you're serious about it because um, it's not if it's something you're serious about, you've got to do it consistently for yourself and for the people you're serving. That's so so good. Oh my goodness, I. I just love talking about stuff like this. I think it's so fun. And I know we've barely scratched the surface. There's just so much to yeah. branding and messaging and marketing and, yeah. and all those things. But I just really love watching the way that you do your business because it really does. You, you just really can tell the difference between somebody who's just icky and slimy and selling and somebody who really is listening to their audience, understanding the need and finding ways to meet the need while being authentically themselves. And I think you do that so well. So thank you so much for being willing to share your time and your wisdom with us. You guys, I, I just feel like everybody needs to go and follow you so they can learn more and just continue unpacking this. Cause if this is something that you have questions about or are interested in, 
Trust me, Grace is your girl. So Grace, will you please tell everybody where they can connect with you and keep this conversation going? Thanks, Hannah. It's First of all, it's been such an honor <laughs> sharing with you and sharing with your audience. I don't take this opportunity lightly. So thank you so much. Um, you can find me at gracemariegriffith.com and then on Instagram at gracemariegriffith. And there's resources there for you. And if you have a question, you can reach out to me in DMs or email. Um, one of my biggest things is responding as soon as you, I mean, within 24, 48 business, <laughs> course, we'll just let things sit. And so um, that's essential for me to have conversations with you and listen to you. So um, yeah, I would love to start a conversation with you there. Thank you so much, man. This has been so fun. You guys definitely go follow Grace. She is doing this so, so well. And I, I just love this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to tune into another episode of the Byword Show. I love having you here and I'm so thankful for your support. Don't forget to share a screenshot of this episode to let me know you were here. I can't wait to talk again soon, but in the meantime, be sure to come hang out with me on Instagram and remember, I am cheering you on.